we're spending Advent this year looking at Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament, which was completed about 400 years before the birth of Jesus, is a group of books that anticipate the coming of Jesus. And during this season of Advent, we're anticipating the, the day of his birth. And so as we look back and remember that he made all of these promises for thousands of years and then he fulfilled all of them by coming on Christmas, we get our hope and courage because he made another promise that he's going to come again for us. And so, so we wait again for him to return for his people and for his church. We know that day is coming and we know it's a sure thing because he kept his promises before and he'll surely keep them again. And what we hope to see in him today as we, we open the scriptures is to see the reason that he can be trusted as a source of joy. And, and hopefully the way that we can break up our apathy and the indifference that creeps into our spiritual lives. We open the Bible because we believe it's a book that shows us Jesus and seeing Jesus is transformative. And so as we see him there, as we open the word, as we look at his face, we expect to be transformed by him. And one of the ways that you see Jesus in the Old Testament is in the story of this people Israel and in their search for a true king. This nation of Israel, they were a unique people. They were the only nation in history that God made a special covenant with. God had a unique relationship with Israel. He gave them his laws like the Ten Commandments. He gave them promises that they would be God's people and God would be their God. And one of the distinctions in that nation of Israel is that they wouldn't need a king like the nations around them did. And the reason for that was because God was their king. God reigned and, and exercised his reign through their law. They had judges that applied that law. Under God, they were free people with no need for a king over them because God truly was their king. But then they started to look around at the nations around them. And they saw these nations with kings. These nations seemed to be strong. It seemed like their kings unified them. Their kings made them really intimidating and dangerous. And then the Israelites looked at the people who were leading them, their judges, and they were deficient. They, they weren't as strong as those kings. Also, they just weren't righteous. They, they weren't meeting the expectations of the people. And so the people said, forget this whole, let's be a unique nation with God as our king thing. We want kings like every other nation has. And this is how that went down. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you're old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they're also doing to you. Now then obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So, so God says to Samuel, yeah, they, they're rejecting my reign over them, but give them what they want. Give them the king, but then warn them what a king will be like. So verse 10, it says, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he'll appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and to make his implements of war in the equipment of his chariots. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and he'll give, he'll give them to his servants. He'll take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He'll take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and he'll put them to his work. He'll take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. So his people demand a king, and God says, okay, give them what they want, but make sure they know what they're getting. And so, so Samuel warns them. He says, you will get a king, but when you give any person that much power, it has a tendency to corrupt. And so your kings will, will rule over you, and they will oppress you. They'll start to think that they own your things, taking your orchards like they belong to them. They'll think that they own your children. They'll take your children and, and, and treat them like they're theirs. 
they'll take a tenth of your flock. And this is hard for us to imagine in our day, but in their day, governments could get so oppressive that they would charge a 10% income tax. So, <laughs> so, so it would get bad. He warned them. And, and in seriousness, what, in, what's significant about that is that the king would try to take the place of God because God demanded that they give 10%. God demanded that they give a tithe. He, he wanted them to give a 10% of their increase to worship him. And you did that as a way of saying that everything I have belongs to God. All I have is yours. And so, so they gave the 10th as a way of worshiping and saying that. And so a king who comes in and demands a tithe is claiming that everything's his. And the people would go and they would dedicate their children to God. And then the king would come and claim them. And totalitarian governments throughout the world do the same today. They, they try to take the place of God because gods don't share their people. God claims his people, and kings, when it goes to their head, they, they claim those people too. And God squeezes out tyrannical rulers, and tyrannical rulers squeeze out God. And this is why when you look at, at countries where there's totalitarian rule, you always see oppression of the church because gods don't share their people. Chesterton once said, once abolish the God and the government becomes the God. Ultimate power will always rest somewhere. And so the people hear this warning and they ignore it. And then they get what they want. They, they get a king. But God's incredibly gracious. And you see him again and again in all kinds of ways, continually coming to his people to help clean up the messes that they've made. And so 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, God made, made this deal with them. And this is gracious. He didn't have to do this. He told them not to ask for a king. They asked for one anyway. They got their king. But he gave them this promise. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice, and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. And if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it'll be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and against your king. So God, who's like this father, who's just always coming and bailing his son out of jail, like basically saying, don't do that thing, we do that thing. And then he comes and he helps us after we've done that thing. He told them what they shouldn't do. They did it anyway. And so God graciously comes to their rescue and he says, you shouldn't have asked for a king, but here's the deal. If you're faithful and your king is faithful, I'll allow it to go well. There can be such a thing as a faithful king. And I'll allow for you to thrive even under a king if the people are righteous and the king is righteous. And that began the days of waiting for the true king to come. A king who was strong and powerful, who would lead the people like they wanted to be led, but also who would be faithful to God and blessed by God. And so Saul becomes the king, and it, it looks good at first. He wins some battles, but then he turns his back on God, and he descends into madness by the end of his life. And comes King David, and he comes on strong. He slays Goliath. He shows huge character, huge courage. He establishes the capital city of Jerusalem. He builds a palace there. He defeats their enemies. He writes psalms because he's a man after God's own heart. But he sins, he abuses his power, he takes Bathsheba, things begin to unravel. He wasn't the true king either. But David had this son. And his son's name was Solomon, which means the man of peace, the shalom man. And, and so he must be the one. He's got to be the true king. And this is what happens when he's anointed, basically when he's sworn in as king. In 1 Kings 1, verse 38, it says, So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. There Zadok, the priest, took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. They blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. So finally, a righteous king. And it's right to celebrate. So the, the people throw a rocking party in celebration of this king. There's so much joy, so much dancing, so much noise that the earth splits because of their celebration. They think they're finally there. We're past the bloodshed of King David. We're past the madness of Saul. We've got our guy. We've got the, the, the king of peace. We've got the one who will reign and rule over us in the right way. And, and sure enough, he starts strong. He's rich. He's powerful. He's wise. He builds a temple where God is worshipped. 
the whole world starts to hear about this guy's wealth and wisdom and they come in and visit and he demonstrates wealth in front of them where, where foreign queens are coming and they're amazed at this man Solomon. He's like a light to all the world around him. He passes on wisdom to his sons. Most of our book of Proverbs was written by him. It's his way of passing on wisdom so that the generations would know the Lord. I mean, the champ is here. Like this is a big moment because they finally got Solomon. And Proverbs 29 too says, when the righteous increase or when they rule, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. And so at this moment, the people are rejoicing. Such a celebration, it's so huge that the earth splits. And that's the right way to respond to the right king. With joy and celebration, with hope for the future, with peace for your security now that you don't have to worry about all these other countries around you because you've got your strong king. There's a certain sense of relief because now there will be good justice. It's not like a clown in charge. We've got like a good guy running this place and he's wise and he, and he knows how to, to deal wisely. The, the law of God is going to be in the driver's seat so, so, because now we've got the wisest man ever to live interpreting that law for us. There's no room for apathy at all when the righteous king rises. You can relax, you can rejoice, you can let your hair down, you can celebrate with abandon because you've got your king. But then you read on, and even Solomon falls. His success brings all kinds of temptation toward decadence, and he gives in. He, he falls in love with his money. He falls in love with his own glory. He indulges his lusts. He worships other gods. And so once again, the people are disappointed. And this cycle of hope and joy followed by crushing disappointment continues. We know what this is like. It's far worse to have a hope like that and then have it crushed than to never hope at all. And if a nation goes through that cycle enough times, it's just going to change the psyche of the people. You'd expect people like that who have those repeated cycles of hope and joy followed by failure and disappointment to become very jaded and very guarded. You'd be really careful to ever get hopeful again. You'd feel like you could have some joy, but your joy always had to have a seatbelt on because you, you had to be cautious enough with it because that could get out of hand and then you could have your heart crushed. You see that much failure in the people that you'd hoped in, you're going to guard your heart and you're not going to get too wrapped up in any of it again. Which obviously, you know, I know the bills are an easy analogy here, like where we know this way of thinking. We, we know how to guard our hearts. So I was watching the game with my son last week and the bills are kneeling down at the end of the game. Like they've won it at that point. And, and there's seconds left on the clock and my son goes, they could still lose. Because... <laughs> because he knows, you know, like we, we have to protect our hearts. You can't get too into it. And there are times for us where, where life, the Bills season becomes like a metaphor for our lives, where we, we always have to protect our hearts. And we do it by getting cynical, by getting sarcastic. We get kind of like meh about everything because we don't want to get too into every, anything because we'll be disappointed. So everything becomes an eye roll. Everything's a little bit suspicious. You hold back on joy to avoid the heartbreak. You keep Joy's seatbelt fastened tight to keep yourself from, from getting disappointed. And because you can't get too into anything, everything becomes boring, everything starts to seem dull, because you know everything will disappoint in the end, so I've got to be careful. But God keeps speaking to these jaded people. He keeps making promises. He says, you see how no good king is coming from you? You see how you can't find a truly righteous king from among you? Well, not only will I allow it to go well for you if you do find a righteous king, I'm going to send you that king. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Promises them in Micah 5 too, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And now you can already see where this sermon is going. This is very predictable. Jesus is this true king. He's the king that doesn't disappoint in the end. He's the king that is worth celebrating with so much joy that the earth splits. 
He isn't the king that fails at the end of his story. He looks like he does. He's up there, he's being crucified on a cross, he's dying like a criminal, looks like another king has failed, but then he rises again. He defeats death, and he reigns even now as the perfect king. Even now, he's powerful and wise. Even now, people from around the world are drawn to his wisdom. He slays our greatest enemies, and and like any king, he claims to be sovereign. He claims to rule over all. He claims all of our lives as his own but he's the one good king. And everything we give to him, he gives back a thousand times more. Luke 6, 38, he said, give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. In Mark 10, 29, Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in, in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and land with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So he's a king who claims it all, but then gives it back to us in different forms. It's not a prosperity gospel. But he gives back to us a thousandfold anything we gave him. Any sacrifices we make, he restores to us. And even those who die for him rise again oppressive kings come in all the time and they say your life exists for me Jesus comes in and he gives his life for us so in Jesus the champ is here and when the righteous increase the people rejoice so in Jesus we should have so much joy that the ground splits as we celebrate but then the question is then why are we so apathetic if the response to the true king when, when the true king comes, is to celebrate, then why in our lives are we just so meh? Like, why do we lack joy? We can be characterized by, by what's called acedia, which is not a word that we use much, but Dorothy Sayers defines it as the sin which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and only remains alive because there's nothing it would die for. Man, that sounds like us pretty often, doesn't it? Blah. So why is that us if the righteous king reigns? I mean, it makes sense that we've gotten disillusioned about other kings, other leaders, other hopes. It makes sense that we would be jaded about an awful lot in life because we're always being sold stuff that doesn't work, that doesn't pan out. But if Jesus really is this king, why the apathy? Why am I, why are we so often so spiritually indifferent and asleep and cold? And then what can we do about it? In his excellent book, Overcoming Apathy, uh, Uche Anazor lays out some of the reasons for our apathy and, and what we can do about it. And one of the reasons for it is just doubt. That we don't believe all this stuff is true. Because to believe the Christian story is to believe the most thrilling of stories. And if Jesus is who he says he is, and he is, then in him we can find the greatest of joys. But a big part of our apathy is that we don't believe that these things really happened. We don't believe that Christ really rose. We don't believe this theology that we have these concepts of is really true and active and strong and begging to be applied and put into practice. And sometimes even the message of Christmas for us can become just sentiment, where the story is just sort of the the background music at Target. It's a childhood fantasy. In our minds, it's not real. It's almost like we don't really believe. Because to believe this stuff would be to be thrilled with it. Sayers again writes, Now we may call that doctrine exhilarating, or we may call it devastating. We may call it revelation, or we may call it rubbish. rubbish. But if we call it dull, then words have no meaning at all. The Christian message is anything but dull. So often, because we doubt it, we don't really believe it, we take our eyes off it, we push it into the background of our lives, we can can lose our joy 
and just be apathetic. I think another source of our apathy is grief over the disappointments that have come our way and the losses that have come our way that, that keep us from wanting to have zeal again. I think sometimes we've been like so disappointed in church that we can't work up the joy anymore. And churches don't help. We kind of create this problem. We tend to represent ourselves as more than we are. Where we're supposed to be, imperfect gatherings and imperfect communities that point people to Jesus. But we have a tendency sometimes to point people to ourselves and to our programs and to our leaders as the solution. We, we say this is the true one. And I think sometimes it can go to pastor's heads where, where we start to believe that I'm the answer. And then you read story after story of, of how they oppress and only take from their people acting like they are the true king. But even good leaders, all of our leaders will disappoint. I mean, they'll disappoint us either through normal human weakness or through real corruption. And we'd hoped in them. We thought this is the one. And then again and again, we're disappointed by them and, and our hopes and our vision for the church don't all pan out and, and the joy in what could be gives way to the reality of what is. And then we hear them say again, we're supposed to be rejoicing in Christ and we think, but I tried that. Like I did that once. But the thing is, we didn't try that. Jesus gives a lot of good gifts and the church is one of his good gifts. But the gifts are separate from the giver. They're not the same thing. And so often we tried rejoicing in his gifts. We tried really going all in on the good things that he gave us. But those things were never meant to be our God. They were never meant to satisfy. They were never meant to be ultimate. He gives good gifts and even good leaders. They can be helpful, but they're never meant to be the true king. And so we can say, no, I tried rejoicing in Jesus before. But the reality might just be that we rejoiced in something else. So we end up being apathetic about the whole thought of Christianity. Another of Anazor's reasons for our apathy is just the triviality of our day and the way that we mix n important news with totally unimportant news. And you see this on social media more than anywhere. I mean, it was, it was like that on the nightly news where he talks about a commentator who would get on and talk about this devastating news story and then say, and now this, and switch to the, the lighthearted, you know, someone found their kitty after a week story. And, and you almost have to like absorb all these emotions from these two different things that are just so different in size and scope. And you're hearing them both from the same person. It's just not normal for it to be that way. And then you go on social media and you start scrolling and you go past, okay, war in Europe where Putin's threatening to use nukes. And then there's a prank some people played on their friends on the ice. And then there's this device you can get and it helps you chop your onions and then my friend posts about how Jesus rose from the dead. And so you have like all these news stories with all different weight. They're all coming at you at once. And we can just get used to hearing the really big news next to really trivial news. And it has a numbing effect. Like where we numb ourselves to everything. And so numbness to Jesus just kind of fits that pattern. And this can cause us to, to miss the message of the cross and to think that the message of the cross is not that big of a deal to us because it's so commonplace. Like it goes in the same social media drawer as that onion chopper, and so it, it's like it's not that big of a deal. But it's a huge deal. I mean, it means that it's the solution of the, those thousands of years of waiting for the one true king. And there are a couple big reasons why the kings didn't work out in the Old Testament. One is that the kings themselves were sinful like we are. They had sin growing in their heart, and then you gave them power. They had unfettered power now, and they did all kinds of damage, just like many of us would do. Another reason that, that it didn't work out is that even if you had a decent king and he tried to impose God's law, he always tried to impose it from the outside with force. But when you try to impose good laws on people with bad hearts, it doesn't do any good. They reject it. They fight against it. And so in comes Jesus. And he solves both of those problems. He's the one true king who has never sinned, who has no sin growing in his heart. There's nothing evil in him. He always does only those things that please the father. He is the one true and righteous king. And then his message has this power to give us new hearts, to change us from the inside so that he can rule and reign over us, not just by his force, but internally. He's a king who came to rule within the gospel is the solution to the biggest problems facing humanity. 
And the way we receive it is first by recognizing our need. By recognizing I have sinned. I've gone so far from what God has called me to. I've so broken his law that I can't fix it. I need to be forgiven. I need to be rescued. I brought God's punishment on myself. I don't have the relationship with God that I should have. I can't fix this thing. But the king came. So we can trust in Christ. We trust that he's the true king who came to conquer our greatest enemies of Satan, sin, and death. And that the power of his message can change our hearts and take out what scripture calls our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And the way it does that is when we believe. When we believe that he died for us on that cross, taking the wrath of God in our place. We believe that he was buried and we believe that he rose again. If we turn from our sin, we turn from our unbelief, we turn from whatever was driving us before, we turn from our selfishness, we repent, and we believe that what he did on that cross as he died and was buried and rose again is what we need for forgiveness and hope and future. When we believe, we're forgiven. We have relationship with him. And then from that place where we receive forgiveness and grace and mercy, we live changed lives. It'd be easy to be apathetic about Jesus if we thought he just came to bring one more religion, one more moral code, but he came to rescue us. And he came to rescue us in such a profound way that it actually changes us. He came to be that true king that we long for and one that we can really rejoice in. And then when you go to, to his last moments on the cross, he, he's hanging there, he's dying, and in Matthew 27, verse 50, it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Just like the earth split when they celebrated Solomon's reign, the earth splits here as the true king comes to reign. And he's reigning in a way that nobody expected him to reign. He's, he's hanging on that cross. It looked like he, he was a king when he rode in on the colt, but then they put a crown on him, and it wasn't a king's crown. It was a crown of thorns. He promised that he was going to conquer, but the way that he conquered was by dying and then rising again and busting out and conquering the grave. It was all unexpected. But as he conquered in that way, he bridged the gap between God and all who would believe means that if we believe, because the king conquered there on that cross as the earth split beneath him, this means that our sins are really forgiven. It means that our eternity is really guaranteed if we believe. It means that it really will go well for us for all eternity, which means that we can have joy. We can have joy without a seatbelt. We can have joy that doesn't disappoint in the end, that won't leave us cynical and jaded. There's never been a person who went all in on Jesus and 125 years later was disappointed that they did. Everyone has said this is way better than I ever would have thought. If anything, he underpromised and overdelivered. We can have that kind of joy. And, and I'd like to say that we could just download it and have it all in an instant. And maybe if there's just a sin you need to repent of and that frees it all up and kind of gets the clog out, maybe the joy can be restored in an instant for sure. But fairly often it's built. And so some of the things that, that Anazor recommends to help us feed our joy and overcome our apathy are, are number one, confessing our apathy as sin to God and to one another. Like if we really believe that Jesus is king, the true king has come, then joy is the right response. Which means that my apathy, whatever its cause, is not okay. So I gotta confess that is sin. And then we have to live lives where we feed faith and hope and joy. We know how to do this. I mean, it's, it's more Bible, it's more prayer, it's less Instagram and less Twitter, and it won't happen without discipline does take the discipline of disciplining our minds to dwell on what matters. Disciplining our hands to put down the phone. Disciplining our calendars to make time for what matters. We do the things that feed joy. We do the things that feed a high view of Christ so we can be rejoicing in him. 
And definitely, we, we've had griefs and disappointments, and we have doubt, and we should process all of those things, confess and talk through those things with, with God and with his people. Those are real things that really need to be dealt with. But in all of it, we're doing the big thing, which is talking about Jesus. It's easy to talk just about trivial things. And God, God's given us a lot of good trivial things as gifts. And, and we should be thankful for them. And it's not like we have to be afraid of talking about them or being like too spiritual for Jesus where we can't talk about the good things that he's given us in the material world that he's made. We can't talk about those things. But let's also talk about Jesus. Because he is really good. And he is the much bigger deal. He is the true king. And if Solomon was worth celebrating so much that the earth split. How much more is Jesus? And so let's repent. Let's not settle for just being meh and apathetic. Let's not be so cynical. Let's not respond to gospel truth with apathy. Let's believe.